This is Radio 4 VHF FM. Calling Cat's Whisker Studio. Calling Cat's Whisker Studio. You can go ahead now. Well, he's got just one more chance. Oh, good morning. Uh, this is the BBC. It's 9.05 and it's time for Cat's Whiskers. We go over to that media megastar, Paul Nicholas. Good morning. Paul Nicholas here. And have we got a show for you? Have we got a show for you? Yes, we have. There's Asterix the Gaul, Iron Man, and the end of our serial. And we have the result of our playwriting competition. Phew. I did it. On the last edition of Cat's Whiskers, I did a perfect introduction. I honestly believe that nothing can go wrong today. Just put the final nail in my new shelves. I think I'll shelve the shelving idea. <laughs> I found this great book on do-it-yourself projects down in the cellar. You see, I'm leaving today and I thought, well, it might be nice to do the place up a bit. BBC won't be too pleased when they come round and find the place in a mess. Yes, there's that... Uh, BBC inspector coming round later. So a lick of paint here, a spot of plaster there, and, uh, sh Well, no shells. Oh, well. One man band! Yes! How's it going out there? He's fixing the roof. I found a newspaper up here! Where did you find it? In the gutter! Well, don't read that. It's the gutter press. <laughs> a one man band? Do you think it's wise to wear your double bass, accordion, cymbals, harmonica, guitar, bass drum and can zoo up on the roof. I mean, you might be a bit heavy. Whatever you do, don't go near the... Weak part of the roof. Paul! Yes? I think I went too near the weak part of the roof. Where are you? Do you remember my plan for fixing the roof? Yes. It fell through. <laughs> or rather, I did. <laughs> Oh dear, it never rains but it pours. Oh, I'm getting soaking wet. What am I going to do? The roof's fallen in. Still, we could always say we put in air conditioning. I'll just move over here where it's safer, away from that massive hole. Oh! 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 Ow! Oh! Oh! Our man band, did you want the uh, bass drum for today's song? No, thanks. Oh, just as well, because I've landed on it. I landed on Murray Mulch. Oh, hello, Mrs Mulch. Yeah. What are you doing in the bedroom? Um, I came up to weigh myself. 32 stone. That's a lot for one woman. I did have one man band on my head at the time. Oh, there's my intercom. Hello? Pete here in the studio. I brought the post down. I thought you'd be here. It's time for Asterix. What are you all doing? Uh, a spot of do-it-yourself. I didn't know you knew about DIY. Well, we took a crash course. <laughs> Shall I put Asterix on? Yeah. While the druids, Getafix and Psychoanalytics, who have both lost their memories, are trying to find the secret of their magic potion, the day of the big fight between Chief's Vital Statistics and Cassius Ceramics arrives. At the ringside, outside the Roman camp... Roman garrison! Shoulder! Arms! To the ringside! Match! Cassius Ceramics arrives to the cheers of his own men and the Romans. All right, all right, all right! Meanwhile, in the Gaulish village... Time to go, vital statistics! All right. Potion or no potion? I promise to do my best. Long live our chief! Hey! Long live our chief! I will now give you a song of encouragement. <clears throat> oh, golly boy! Oh, no, you don't. That's quite enough of that. <laughs> and the villagers set out, except for Obelix and the Druids, 
who are still tasting each other's potions. <laughs> Try that, my dear fellow. I think you'll be amused by its presumption. Back at the ringside, Centurion Nebulous Nimbus takes charge. This fight goes on until one chieftain throws in the towel. The winner receives the homage of the loser and his Troy. On my right, the Gallo Roman chief, Cassius Ceramic. Ceramics forever! Ceramics forever! Ceramics forever! On my left, the Gaulish chief, Vital Statistics. To your corners, and when you hear the trumpet, come out fighting. May Cassius Ceramics, uh, 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 may, may the best man win. Master X, where's Oblix? Nick back home and get him. We'll need him if things turn nasty after the fight. My chief! And so the fight begins. <laughs> Back in the village, Obelix is sunk in gloom. It's all my fault, Dogmatics. <laughs> to think one little tap with a maneer could... Wait a minute. A tap with a maneer? Then why shouldn't another tap cure our druid? Come on, Dogmatics! <laughs> Oh, 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 I say, let's put all the remaining ingredients into one cauldron and see what happens. Oh, oh I bet we come out in red and green checks. Oh, or yellow with blue spots. Oh, 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 oh. Right, here goes. Oh, right. oh, 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 I say. I, oh, oh, oh. Oh, what in the world? Druid! Druid! You haven't seen my fat friend, have you? No, Asterix, I haven't seen Obelix lately. Uh, 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 Asterix? You called me Asterix? You cured! Watch out, everyone! Here goes! <laughs> Obelix! Oh, no! You... Obelix, did you throw this many here? Yes, yes, to cure the druid. Don't say I've done the wrong thing again. Stop arguing and get me out of here! Oh, yeah. oh, thank goodness he's still cured. Oh, Asterix, what exactly has been happening? Let me explain, Getafix. So Asterix explained. Quick, empty that cauldron and bring me some hot water. I'm going to brew the magic potion! And Getafix, Asterix, and Obelix set out with a fresh supply of potion. The fight has now been going on for half an hour. Ceramics is chasing vital statistics round and round the ring. Stop running, will you, and let me get at you. Vital statistics. Getafix is cured. We're fighting fit now. Ah, that news redoubles my strength. Come on, ceramics! At last. Stop running, eh? Take, Take that! I'm the winner! I'm the greatest! One moment, Gaul. You may have won the big fight. But let's see what you can do against the invincible Roman legions! Invincible Roman legions? Is that us? Don't you worry, Infernal Purpose. They're out of magic potion, remember? And we outnumber them a hundred to one. Come on then, you double-dealing Romans! Do your worst! <laughs> and the Roman legion plunges into the fray. Only to find that the Gauls, fortified with magic potion, are more than a match for them. The Gaul's tactics may seem less skillful. Stop shoving at the back. I try those four on the left. Charge first, fight lead. This is a bit of all right, eh? But they're strikingly effective. Help! Mommy! Oh, 
की सही Time to slip away, I think. Oh no, you won't. Oh yes, I will. Oh. Well done, Obelix. For once, you hit the right person on the head. Ha! Huh? Are you uh, are you dead, ceramics? Oh, uh, beg your pardon, sir. And who may you be? Ceramics. <laughs> By law, I could be chief of your village, but I will be generous. I ask only that you remember you are a Gaul and never support the Romans again. And now you may go home to Linoleum. Home? Linoleum? Where's that? Henceforth, having lost his memory, Cassius Ceramics is a reformed character, and his village returns to its traditional Gaulish ways. Things are back to normal in Asterix's village too. We will celebrate our victory with a banquet. Long live Chief Battlesdestix! You know, Asterix, psychoanalytics may have been right after all. I'm going on a diet. Dry biscuits with a little something on them. What sort of little something? A roast wild boar! <laughs> Scrum strong. <laughs> Great. I thought the ghouls would win in the end. Good. Now, where's that socket? I want to play with my new toy. Well, actually, it's not a toy. It's a machine for sanding down the floorboards. The most powerful one in the world. You see, I'm going for a really trendy approach in the spare bedroom. Going to have no carpet and sanded down floorboards. There's a great section on sanding in my DIY book. It says, um, get a sander, take up the carpet, and do it yourself. Right. Well, I'll just get on the intercom and warn them all that I'm about to start. Roger? Uh, no, Paul. Roger, Paul. Mary Mulch here. I'm in the laundry room. Over. Over what? Over the kitchen, as I recall. Over. Will you stop saying over, over and over? Right, Joe. Over. I'm going to start my sander now. Don't go mad now. Over. Over what? Oh, never mind. No, the sander just rubs away a tiny bit of the wood and you get a nice clean surface. Here goes. Yes, it's going very well. It's going very, very well. It's going well out of control. Ah! Oh! 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 oh. What are you doing, over? Don't say over all the time. I wish you'd let me finish. What are you doing over my washing, hanging upside down? Well, you see, the sander was so powerful, it sanded all the way through the floor. Luckily, I got my legs tangled in this flex, so I'm just going to hang about here <laughs> until I can think of a way down. What about Iron Man? Well, he can't get me down. Hang about. I've got no choice, really. I'll get PJ to do it. <whistles> PJ here. Paul's a bit tied up at the moment. Could you put the tape of Iron Man on? By all means. Here is the final episode of Iron Man by Ted Hughes. Episode 5. The Iron Man's Challenge. A space bat angel dragon, big as Australia, is threatening to destroy the world. The Iron Man challenges him to a test of strength, an ordeal by fire. They both survive the first round, but the test isn't over yet. The Iron Man signalled to the engineers. Once more they poured oil into the trough under the grid. Once more they lit it. And once more the Iron Man stretched himself out on the grid of the raging furnace. The space bat Angel Dragon watched in horror. He knew what this meant for him. He would have to go once more into the sun's flames. The Iron Man's whole body was becoming red hot, then orange and finally white like the blazing wire inside an electric bulb. At this point, the Iron Man was terribly afraid. For what would happen if the flames went on getting fiercer and fiercer? He would melt. But at the very second that the edge of the Iron Man's ear started to melt, the 
the fuel was used up and the flames died. The Iron Man looked up at the dragon. He could hardly speak after his ordeal in the flames. Instead, he simply pointed and jabbed his finger towards the sun. The monster did not laugh. He set off up from the earth towards the sun. Now it was his turn, and he did not laugh. They saw him land among the flames, as before. They saw him begin to glow red, then orange, and at last they could no longer see him. He and the sun were one blinding whiteness. Where was he? Had he melted in the sun? No, here he was. Here he came. Slowly, slowly down through space. Much more slowly than before. His white hot flying body cooled slowly as he came until... <laughs> Heavier than ever, he landed on Australia. All over the world, anybody who happened to be riding a bicycle at that moment instantly fell off. And now, he was a very changed monster. But the Iron Man could not allow himself to pity the space bat angel dragon. He signalled to the engineers. Round three, he shouted. And the engineers began to pour in the oil. But what was this? An enormous hoofing sound. A booming, wheezing, sneezing sound. The space bat angel dragon was weeping. <laughs> enough! Enough, enough! cried the dragon. <laughs> it's too much, I can't stand another. <laughs> the fires of the sun are too terrible for me. <laughs> I submit. Then I've won, shouted the Iron Man. You've won, yes, you've won, and I'm your slave cried the space bat angel dragon. I'll do anything you like, but not the sun again. And he plunged his chin into the Pacific to cool it. Very well, said the Iron Man. From now on, you are the slave of the earth. What can you do? Alas, said the space bat angel dragon, I am useless, <laughs> utterly useless. All we do in space is fly or make music. Make music? asked the Iron Man. How? What sort of music? Haven't you heard of the music of the spheres? asked the dragon. It's the music that space makes to itself. All the spirits inside all the stars are singing. I'm a star spirit. I sing too. The music of the spheres is what makes space so peaceful. Then whatever made you want to eat up the earth? asked the Iron Man. If you're all so peaceful up there, how did you get such greedy and cruel ideas? The dragon was silent for a long time after his question. And at last he said, It just came over me, listening to the battling shouts and the war cries of the earth. I got excited. I wanted to join in. Well, you can sing for us instead, said the Iron Man. It might do us all good. And so it was fixed. The space bat angel dragon was to send his star back into the constellation of Orion and he was to live inside the moon. And every night he was to fly around the earth through the heavens singing. And then the whole world began to hear a strange soft music that seemed to fill the whole of space. Meanwhile the Iron Man was the world's hero. He went back to his scrapyard but now everybody in the world sent him a present. Some only sent him a nail. Some sent him an old car. One rich man even sent him an ocean liner. He sprawled there in his yard, chewing away, with his one ear slightly drooped where the white heat of that last roasting had slightly melted it. As he chewed, he hummed in harmony to the singing of his tremendous slave in heaven. And the space bat angel's singing had the most unexpected effect. Suddenly, the world became wonderfully peaceful. The singing got inside everybody and made them as peaceful as starry space. 
all their earlier squabbles forgotten. The strange, soft, eerie space music began to alter all the people of the world. They stopped making weapons. All they wanted to do was to have peace to enjoy this strange, wild, blissful music from the giant singer in space. And that is the end of the story of the Iron Man. That was the last episode of The Iron Man. And now, a Cat's Whiskers newsflash. PJ, what do you think you're doing? You were stuck and... How did you get down? Mary Mulch pulled me down. Where is she now? In the kitchen. Another hall in another ceiling? Afraid so. Mm. Oi, what about my newsflash? Come on, shift yourself. Oh. And now, a Cat's Whiskers newsflash. Two tons of glue were emptied over the Lord's Test Match cricket pitch yesterday. Experts are predicting a sticky wicket. And now we go live to Brighton Pier, where Long John Silver has a gale warning. A gale warning! Here it is! Gale! Yes? Be careful, there's a big wave coming. I did warn you. Thank you, Long John Silver. Oh, by the way. Yes? Why do they call you Long John Silver? And now, over to Major Holdup for our traffic report. Yes, news of a lorry load of jelly and a lorry load of custard cream cakes which have collided. Police say motorists should expect trifling delays. This is Major Holdup handing you back to the studio. Thank you, Major Holdup. Now, there's quite a few things you might want to send in. There's your map of the house if you've done one, design of the breakfast-making machine. Oh, and listen, I'd love to hear from you if you want to write to me about Cat's Whiskers. So send all those things to Cat's Whiskers, BBC, P.O. Box 40, Manchester, M60, 1FR. Right, now it's time for the surprise package. The television series One by One is based on the life and times of a real vet, David Taylor. We went along to talk to him and to put to him some of your questions. Yes, I am the real-life Donald Turner, David Taylor. But basically, it is my life. It's the way it all happened. And, you know, watching the BBC drama, sometimes the little hairs on the back of my neck stand up because things that really happened are recreated by the television team and the actors. And it's sort of like living your life over again. Do you ever have to change the storyline if an animal does not do what they are told. You know, that sometimes does happen. But basically, we write the scenes and we instruct and train the actors. Uh, this is one of my jobs, to tell the directors and the actors, look here, you know, the big stars here are not you. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Laurence Olivier. The stars always, of course, are the animals. What I usually do is that with the director, I rehearse the actors using bales of straw. You see, some of the animals, if you wanted them to rehearse while the actors got it right and remember the lines, would get rather bored. So we say, right, get everything worked out with bales of straw representing the elephant or the porcupine or whatever it is in roughly the position where it'll be. And then, when they're ready to roll the cameras, we bring in the real animal and off it goes. But you see, if the animal does something that we've not expected, let's say it's suddenly there's a load of droppings in front of the camera, which, of course, everybody enjoys. Well, that's real life. Do you really amputate animals' arms, legs and tails? That's all done on models. BBC special effects are very, very clever people. They can do anything. When we had to take the tooth out of an elephant, they actually built, at great expense, an actually working elephant's head, all out of fibreglass and plastic and rubber. And the ears wiggled mechanically, and the eyes rolled, and the eyelids fluttered. And you know, there was actually a man inside the head with a kettle of boiling water, and the steam came out of the spout, and then out of the mouth of the elephant to look like hot breath. 
And these marvellous special effects people had threaded plastic tubes into the jaw so that when the tooth came out, the blood came out of the socket because it was sort of red dye. And it's this special red, sort of vampire-like blood that come, comes out of tubes. But they're so clever at producing these models that people really think, oh, good grief, for the sake of drama, they've actually uh, opened up a tiger or And, you know, we did have, in the first series, a tiger to be operated on. Where do we get it from? Not from a zoo, but from a museum. And BBC engineers put motors inside the chest to make it breathe. They put a little motor in the neck to make a blood vessel in the neck flutter. And all the electrical wires controlling these motors came out through its bottom. <laughs> Thank you, David Taylor. I thought... Map to the fore, up the stairs, across the hall, down the long passage, and just before the lab, into the kitchen. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yeah. Oh, you're just in time for a nice glass of milk. Oh, thanks, Mary. Ugh, this milk is horrible. Is it? I bet you left the cow out in the sun this morning. What's that got to do with it? Well, if you leave milk out in the sun, it's bound to go off. Oh, <laughs> oh you're not going to do any DIY here in the kitchen, are you? Of course I am. Why? It's just that this is one of the few rooms left in the house that hasn't been... Fixed up? Wrecked. Oh, nonsense. Now, I've got great plans for the kitchen. I'm going to build a unit round the cooker. Do be careful. They've got the dinner in there. Not to worry. You take... Three two by twos. And dooby dooby doo. Well, man, band, you're not helping. No, because I don't want to get the blame. Rubbish. It's all very safe and very simple. Well, shouldn't I just take the steak and kidney pie out the oven and dish it up first? Oh! I shouldn't bother. The uh, oven's exploded and it's dished itself up. Never mind, chaps. Let's all go into the lab. We are into the lab. Ah. Well, I'll come and join you. Now, where's the door? Yes, don't worry about the door. Just come through the hall in the wall. One man band? Yeah. Play us a song. Oh, good idea. I'll knock one together for you straight away.
your songs? Oh, I watch and I listen. One man band knows about songs, but you know about the lab, PJ. Not really. I do know one thing, though. If you take that green liquid... What, this one? Yeah, that one. And add it to the purple one. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, but above all, you mustn't mix the two together. What, you mean like this? No! Oh! <laughs> down here in the cellar, isn't it? Sorry about that. So as you don't get into any more mischief. Yes? Go and do the quiz. Right. Very good idea, Murray. Into the studio and... It's quiz time. Now, the quiz today is all about descriptions. I'm going to describe three things to you and you've got to guess what they are. Here we go with the first one. Right, well, it's uh, furry, about six inches long, with a little head and a long tail, and it's quite partial to a bit of cheddar. And it makes a sound like this. Got it? A mouse. And here's the second one. Now, this object has a back, a front, and a spine. It's full of all the words there are, but to describe it properly would take all the words in the book. Have you got it? It's a dictionary. Right, the last object... Well, this is a very strange object. It has a head, a tail, and although it's round, it isn't round for very long. And it makes a sound like this. <laughs> got it? A ten-pence piece. Well, that's the last of our Cat's Whiskers competitions. I do hope you've enjoyed them. I certainly have. It's time for the final play. And after that, we have Colin Baker, who's going to tell us who the overall winner is. Wham! Wins the War by Eloise Seneschal. No, 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 madam, it's not a lump of cheese, it's an ancient skull. Oh, no, of course it ain't complete. That's why you thought it was some cheese, was it? Very interesting. Now, keep it alive, please. No, madam, you may not take away an ancient skeleton's left leg bone as a souvenir. Not even if you are an American. Tickets, please. Uh, yes, yes, that way, sir, over there. Tickets, please. Uh, yes, the loo's over there, love. Uh, no, no, madam, I was not addressing you. Uh, tickets, please. It's so stuffy in here. Come on, Ben, I'm bored. I've been traipsing around all day in this boring old exhibition. Oh. Might have been interesting if I could have seen all the people's heads. Suppose it's all right for you. You're only a baby. I can't even play my radio. Oh, hey, I wonder what's in that corner over there. Uh, don't look in that corner, miss. They ain't on display. What aren't? Oh, he's gone. Well, I'll just have a look. One tiny little look can't hurt. Come on, Ben. Oh, I'll carry you. Yeah! Oh! Oh! Cave skins, look, Ben. Look up. Unibus, unibus, yes, yes. Hey, should I try one on? No one will notice, surely. Oh, I dare myself to. Yes, I will. Yeah. Hey, oh, it's nearly on. I don't, don't I look good? Fancy a cave person carrying a radio. And a baby with modern clothes alongside her. Now I'll just fit on this last bit. <laughs> Gosh, look! It's like another world. And wow, cavemen. I've come back in time. Whoa! Oga! Oga! Whoa, this, huh? Um, um, me, Sue. Do you understand? Oga! Oga! Me! Oga! Me! Understand? Not. Too well, though. Me call friend. Me think that friend better interpret Oh, thinking that we can. Oh, him speak our language. Him, him, him with the messy hair. I speak. How do you bong along? Two thirty two. Logs and give you. My amaya talk it down. Oh, Kakana. Oh, he will be much help in interpreting. 
Lucky we speak English as part of language. Uh, yes. Hey, Blob. Blob, Kusanu, Chi 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 Chi, Pokidoms. What do you want, Oga? Blippity, Socky Bottom. Eating Toloko Pokidoms. Oh, hello, strangers. You. Welcome to our village, mm. but you come at bad time. Oh. We soon have war with other tribe. Other tribe called Badiboos. We called Hairy Feet. <laughs> Down with Badiboos. Oh, Up with Hairy Feet. Oh. Come, we prepare for war. Oh, I still got my radio. Oh, well, why not take it into war with me, too, seeing as I'm going to have to fight? The Maddie Boots are broke. We are small in number, but we will fight. Oh, Oxy Boots. Oh, Ben, you should be in the village. Ah, they're fighting us. Oh, no, there are about three billion of them. Ben, where are you? Help! Big lump, take hostage. Hurry up. She take hostage. Hurry Take him, Hardy Ha! We take him, Hardy Ha! Oh no! The Bunny Boos have got Ben! They're taking him hostage! Help! Help! This must be a bad dream! If I pinch myself, I'm bound to wake up! Oh, what about putting on my radio? Maybe that'll do the trick! This new weapon? Oga, Oga! I don't know who you are or where you come from, but one thing I know, you are heroin. Oh. That's all very well, but how are we supposed to get back? Oh, never mind that. I want to hear your gods sing from weapon again. Okay. <laughs> Oi, I thought I told you not to meddle with them costumes. But I... But, oh, it must have been a dream then. But where's my radio? Ah, ah. And now we have Colin Baker to tell us who are the overall winners of our playwriting competition. But first he'll explain what the judges were particularly looking for in the plays. The brief was two things, basically. One, that it should work as a radio play, but secondly, and I think the most important, that it should work purely as a story. And so that the ones that we eventually chose as winners, I think, satisfied both those criteria. There were super stories, all of them, and they worked extremely well on radio. We decided unanimously, actually, every, every single one of the judges agreed that the, the overall winner in the individual section was Lisa Palmer, who wrote Night Games, which was a, a beautiful and unusual story. It had... Uh, quite a lot underneath it and quite a lot that was very original. The runners-up in that section were Ben Hales, who wrote Great Big Jelly Warmer in the Sky, and Eloise Seneschal, who wrote Wham Wins the War, both also super stories and both very original. And in the group section, we decided that the winner was The Scotty's Revenge, written by Deirdre Fraser, Amanda McMillan, Kirsty Taylor, Karen Kettles, Martin Baker and Denise Midler, way up in Inverness. And uh, congratulations to them. And we'd just like to take the opportunity to thank all three of the judges, Alan Akeborn, Alan Bleasdale and Colin Baker, for all their help with the competition. Thank you. Right, we're nearly at the end now, and the man from the BBC will be here soon to inspect the premises. Let's all go and have a look round. <laughs> oh, I think we'd better take the equipment just in case. Yeah, maps up. <laughs> up the steps. Mm -hmm. There's not a great deal left. I've just had the most brilliant idea. We can use the winning map to show the architect what the inside of the house looked like when they come to rebuild it. So don't forget to send those maps in. There's not, not a great deal left. At least the front door's still standing. There goes the front door. Who's that man? Hello. I'm the BBC inspector. Couldn't be the BBC inspector, I suppose. But, but I'll handle this. May I come in? I think we'd better all go out. 
Are you Mr. Peter Nicholas? Paul Nicholas, actually. Where's Mr. Peter Nicholas? I've never heard of him. Well, who's been doing the Cat's Whiskers radio programme, then? You? Well, uh, yes. But you're not an official radio person. Uh, no. You're not even authorised to broadcast. Well, no. And yet you've, you've done jolly well. What? Oh, thanks. Hope you looked after the studio. Oh, I have. I've even done a bit of... <coughs> well, what is it, PJ? Don't mention the DIY. Uh, a, a, a bit of... Uh, broadcasting. Ah. Uh. Saved by the whistle? I managed to rescue the kettle out of all the debris. Shh. Oh, great. It's time for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hollins. My favourite. It's very exciting. So here we go, then. Here is part five, the last part of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hollins. I don't know why I bother being here. The Hollins family's weekend trip to London does not augur well when Albert Hollins, Henry's dad, is given some medicine by mistake that turns him into Edward Hyde, a horrible, hairy monster. Albert finds himself arrested by Detective Sergeant Leslie Cooney and hauled off to a police station where he's taken down a great many steps and led up to the door of a cell. Right then, in you go and in you stay, my lad, until you are ready to reveal to us your name and address. You play ball with us and we'll play ball with you. Isn't that a fact, Constable Poole? Uh, do you mean like football, Sarge? Or ping pong? No, oh, you great soft silly wazzock. Oh, never mind, lucky him up. <laughs> And you'll remain on watch outside this cell pool until I say otherwise, clear? Right, Sarge. You will not open this cell door, no matter what stunts the prisoner tries to con you with, clear? Right, Sarge. Shh, 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 listen. Listen, can you hear anything, Poole? Uh, no, Sarge. Just take a peep through that peephole, pool and see what he's getting up to. Oh, uh, well, he's not doing anything, Sarge. He's just sitting there on his bunk. With his airy face and his airy hands. Ah, he'll be feeling sorry for himself then. The enormity of his past misdeeds will suddenly have overtaken him in his solitude. All right, Poole, he's all yours. Remember what I said. Right, Sarge. And so Detective Sergeant Cooney went off in pursuance of his official duties, leaving Constable Poole on watch and Albert Hollins locked in his lonely prison cell. Albert let out a long, sad sigh. Oh, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. If this is what they call the holiday, give me the garden norm factory in the middle of the Christmas rush. Oh, I want a cup of tea. Hey! Anybody out there? Yeah, what do you want? What chance have I got for a cup of tea? Slip him down, Charlie. Oh, use your lavy then. You know about a phone call? I'm entitled to make a phone call. You're entitled to nothing, sir. Yes, I am. I'm definitely entitled to a phone call. I've seen them do it on these police chairs on the telly. When? Many a time. Name one. All the time, every time. Whenever anybody gets arrested, the prisoner is always entitled to one phone call. Always without question. Well, what about E.T.? He phoned home. I don't care what E.T. did. You're not committing. You're not getting a phone call, so let that be an entry. You're not getting anything till you tell us who you are and where you come from. Uh, what's the point of arguing? I wouldn't know what to do with a phone call if I got one. There's nobody I could ring. I can't phone Emily. She mustn't find out I've turned into a hairy, horrible monster. I can't tell them who I am. I can see me being stuck in here forever. Oh. <sighs> and Albert Hollins sighed another long, sad sigh and went back to feeling sorry for himself. It might have cheered him up a little, of course, if he'd known that Henry, his son, and Reggie Perkins, the hotel porter, were outside the police station at that very moment, sitting in Mr Perkins' parked-up escort. Although it didn't seem that there was much that they could do to help. 
Well, can't we do anything at all, Mr Perkins? Not a lot, young Hollins, except bide our time. Oh. Here, are you absolutely sure, Henry, that we shouldn't advise your mum as to his present whereabouts? He won't want mum to know what's happened to him. I'm absolutely sure of that. Oh, well, she must be wondering where you are, or the pair of you. She must be absolutely worried stiff. And Mr Perkins was absolutely right. I'm absolutely worried stiff, said Emily Hollins. Albert's wife and Henry's mother. I'm sure I don't know if I've done what's best. What's your opinion? It's hard to tell with ties, Mrs. Hollins, if you aren't personally acquainted with the gentleman they're intended for. Why don't you ask your husband what he thinks about the ties? Oh, he's hopeless on ties, is Albert. In any case, I don't know where he is to ask him. He's out gallivanting somewhere with our Henry. They'll be out seeing the sights. And a fat lot of sightseeing I look like getting to do if they don't turn up soon. We're going home tomorrow. Hey, do you fancy doing some sightseeing now? Oh, how could we go? By cab, it'd cost a fortune. Wouldn't cost us anything at all, Mrs. Hollins. Oh. You see that gentleman sitting over there? Yes. That's Leo Sopwith. He's the chauffeur to an hour of Prince that's staying in the hotel. Oh, my word. I was chattering to him earlier on. Prince mm. Arkwright's given him the day off. He'll show for us. He loves to drive round, and the prince doesn't mind at all if he uses the coach. An Arab prince's coach, no less. Do you fancy it, then? Oh, I'll say. Don't I just? Albert and Henry will be green with envy and serve them right. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but Albert Hollins, right at that moment, had more important things to think about. Something distinctly odd was happening to him in the quiet of his lonely cell. <gasps> he went as a strange and curious feeling passed over his entire body, and he cried as another mysterious tremor, stronger than the first, shook him from head to foot. Then ah! he exclaimed as the extraordinary sensation engulfed him all over yet again. Albert Hollins sat down heavily on the wooden bunk. Oh, my goodness me, moaned Albert. And then he paused, looked down at his hands, blinked, gulped hard and then blinked again. They've gone. All those hairs off the back of me hands. And, and, and me voice. It's mine again. Wait a minute, just to make sure I, I, I'll feel me face. Oh, yes. Smooth as a newborn baby's bum. Oh, I'm me again. I'm Albert Hollins. Hey, constable, you out there. Let me out of here at once, shouted Albert Hollins, beating with his fists on the door of the cell. Hey, 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 less noise in there. You've been told already. This door's staying very firmly shut until you're ready to reveal your true identity. Tell us who you are, where you come from. I'm ready now. Pardon? I'm ready now to reveal my true identity. Are you really? Yes, I've just said so, haven't I? You're not kidding me, are you? You're not trying to pull my leg? No. See this wet, see this dry, slit my throat if I tell a lie? Yes. Say it, then. See this wet, see this dry, slit my throat if I tell a lie? Oh. Oh. Well, in that case, hang about, I'll open up. <laughs> hey, who's the thump are you? I'm Albert Hollins. I live at Woodview, Nicholas Nickleby Close, Taperwood, and I'm employed in the front office and packing department at Guard Norms Limited. Just a minute, just a minute. Not so fast. I don't want to know who you are, matey. It's the other geezer I'm concerned with, the hairy merchant, the monster Herbert. There isn't anyone else. Oh, isn't there, just? Call the other one, it's got bells on it. You wait here, and don't go away while I go inside the cell and look. Constable Poole strode into the cell and examined carefully every inch of it. That's odd he said, as he looked behind the door and found nobody hiding there, and... That's strange. He muttered as he peered underneath the bunk and found nobody hiding there either, and then... That's tawny! He exclaimed as he came out of the cell, only to discover that while he'd been inside, Albert Hollins had snatched at opportunity, taken to his heels, and gone. Detective Sergeant Cooney will be cross. It's the Perkins! Look, it's Dad! Hey! He's coming out of the police station! And he's not all hairy and horrible any longer. He's changed back into just a plain, ordinary dad. Cried Henry Hollins, who was still waiting in the hotel porter's parked-up escort outside the police station. Oh, blimey, O'Reilly. 
Am I glad to see the pair of you? <laughs> we wonder what had happened to you. I'm wondering what hasn't happened to me. I'm beginning to wonder what else could happen to me. Your wish is my command, Mr. Rollins. What would you like to happen to you? Where would you like me to drive you to? Well, away from here, for starters, before the word gets round the police station that I've escaped mm. and the entire flipping flying squad starts looking for me. No sooner said than done. It's all behind you now, Mr. Rollins, your unfortunate mishap. Forget the bad beginning, eh? Your Diamond Days weekend starts here. Sights of London, here we come, eh, Dad? Right, what would you like to look at first? Oh, I don't know. It's all been like an awful nightmare up to press. I can't think straight. You choose somewhere, Henry. You know where I want to go the most, Dad? Well, if he doesn't know, I'm pretty sure I do, mate. And we've just got time to make it before they close. Hang on. Oh, brill. It's brill, that isn't it? Mm, well, it's... Uh... It's all right, I suppose. I can think of places far more convivial than the Chamber of Horrors. It's brill, Dad. Look, there's a fellow having his head chopped off over there. And look at that monster up that dank, dark street, Dad. Oh, do you have to bring up the subject of monsters, Henry? Oh. What's up, Dad? Uh, oh, you feeling all right, Mr. Rollins? Uh, uh. I don't think we should have brought him here, Mr. Perkins. I think he's changing back into that hairy, horrible monster. Oh, I hope not, mate. There's someone coming. Albert Hollins. Oh. Our Henry. Fancy bumping into the pair of you <laughs> down here. Why, if it isn't Mr Perkins. Hello, Deborah. Surprise, surprise. What a coincidence. What are you two doing down here? The same as you lot, I expect. Yes. I'm showing Mrs Hollins all the sides. <laughs> are you all right, Dad? Yes, yes, I'm fine. But it wasn't what we thought it was, thank goodness. It was just a little twinge down my back. I'm a glad it's You're not still having trouble with your back, Albert. I thought that doctor had given you something for it. Do you think you ought to see him again? Oh, no.